Today I have for you a good um, encouragement from many places in the scriptures. Um, and um, for those of you who have gone, been going through anything or discouraged or wondering where you're at with the Lord or any number of things like that, um, I have an encouragement for you today and that encouragement is get up and enter in. Can I hear a yay? Oh yeah, you're muted. Uh, <laughs> praise God. So I want to start in uh, 2 Kings chapter 2. Now you, I'm going to be going through a lot of scriptures, so if you want to just jot down the references, that's fine, and then just listen to me read it, however you want to do it. 2 Kings 2, and I'll be reading verses 11 through 14. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven and Elisha saw it and he cried, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them or tore them. Uh, in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and he smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither. And Elisha went over. So Elisha being the younger one, uh, he's the one who, you know, uh, picked up the mantle of Elijah and went across the Jordan that was divided by the waters. Um, and so Elisha probably compared himself to Elijah, who before that time was a great, great prophet who stood for God under many troubling circumstances. And Elisha probably felt inferior in a lot of ways and probably compare, compared himself with Elijah. Um, but when we read this story, we see that whatever you are, if you're Elisha, whatever you are, don't change, exchange. And he rent his own clothes. He tore his own what he wore and he threw it down and he picked up the mantle of another, of Elijah, of someone who knew God, of, of, for us, for Jesus. You pick up that mantle and you cover yourself in that. And you, and you stand with that in your spirit, whether you're that or not. And yet he took that mantle and he hit the water and it parted. Elijah's mantle did the work, but it said, Elisha walked over. Praise God. So, um, uh, first he tore his own garment, which is to make his, his view of himself useless. He can't wear that anymore. And then he put on Elijah's garment. <laughs> Praise God. All right. And then um, there's, a, uh, there's a scripture in Romans. Uh, it's Romans 13, 13. And it says, Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. I want to use another scripture. And like I said, I'm going to be going through a lot of scriptures. And I'm talking a little fast because I'd like to give you all that the Lord has shared with me. This is Matthew 26, 73 through 75. And it's talking about Peter. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech betrayeth thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man, and immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow thou shalt deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now, I want to give you just a short time after this in the book of Acts, which was just a short time after this situation. Uh, Acts 3, 13 through 15. 
This is Peter speaking to the crowds. <clears throat> the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his Son, Jesus, whom ye delivered up and, listen to these words, whom ye delivered up and denied him. Mm, this is Peter saying this. Uh, in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. And verse 14 is, But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised up from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. So the first thing Peter says is, God wants to glorify his Son. That's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing is, is that he's talking to them about denying him. Peter's the one, either, either he's a hypocrite or he's found something here because he's talking to them about denying him. He uses that word twice, denied, deny him, but you have denied the Holy One. Um, and so, um, so I'll just read this quick part here. Peter had denied the Lord at least as to his earthly association with him as from Galilee in earthly ministry. But he told the Jews that they had denied the Lord. But now Peter stood with the Lord as one in Christ and exalted him as the fulfillment. Um, uh, this stand that he took is what changed everything. Uh, get up and enter in. And he denied and he wept bitterly and it was terrible. And it was horrible what he said and he cursed and all of this kind of stuff. But very shortly... He got up and he entered into Christ and into the reality of that oneness with Christ. And he put on, as it were, that mantle. And he put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he stood as one that was with the Lord in death and in burial and in resurrection. And he spoke to those who also now are denying him. And he's speaking boldly so that they can see we can come out of this too. Even if we've done the most horrible things, we can come out of this. <clears throat> um, so, I'm moving right along here. Luke chapter 1 and verse 31 through 35. And this is the angel talking to Mary. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son. Do you notice how much it's talking about the son and bringing forth the son? And over and over. Uh, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, there, of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost, woo, I've just got Holy Ghost goosebumps. <laughs> the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, um, and the power, the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Yay! Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. All right, so the highest, not you, you're not the highest, is going to overshadow you. And what's going to be the result? You're going to bring forth the Son. You're going to bring forth the Son. So I wrote, the Bible says that Mary was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. The result was now Christ was her new form. He's being formed in her. And his, his, and then the highest, the Father, the highest, His form casts a shadow over who we are, who we were before. We were just a little Mary that didn't, you know, so young and so, you know, caught up in all these circumstances. And yet, the highest overshadows her. And then the result of that is when you get overshadowed, you bring forth the sun. There's hope in all of that confusion of well, how can this be and all this. Um, uh, this is done that his form is seen on us and in us. This is not a horrible experience for those who understand it, for it is a great delight. And I'm taking this from Song of Solomon 2, 3. I sat under his shadow with great delight. Yay! Yay! This is a delightful thing to be overshadowed so that the sun can come forth. 
All right, Mount of Transfiguration. See, we're hitting a lot of stuff here. Um, this is uh, uh, in uh, Matthew 17, and I'm only going to read verse 5 through 8. And then, well, we'll go 5 through 8. <clears throat> While he yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, here it is again, folks. Listen to what keeps happening in these stories we're so familiar with. This is my beloved son. Praise God. Do you get it? You want to you wanna get out of the doldrums, out of, out of being messed up, out of failing after do, time and time, this and that? Just get overshadowed. And God's ready to do it so he can bring forth his son. And overshadowed the, them, and a, behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man except Jesus. Okay, so he goes, they're, they're afraid and they fall down and, oh no, what are we going to do? What, what are we going to do? And Jesus comes over, puts his hand on him, says, arise, arise, get up, uh, get up and enter in. And then when they look around, they only see Jesus. Now they only see Jesus. Yeah, praise God. We need to be overshadowed. All right. Uh, Luke 10, 38. This is Martha and Mary, 38 through 42. Aren't these great stories? And they're all ones we know and we can draw life and get coursing through our veins the reality of Christ instead of our lives and where we fail or where we're at. Even if we're doing good, we can still get up and enter in. All right. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And said, um, and she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. So I put Mary at Jesus' feet gives us a picture of what it is to, it is to find one who is learning the word. Mar Mary is learning the word. Uh, in her heart, she is not studying. Oh, oh. Um, she is drawing out the living word from the bosom of Jesus. I want to do that. I don't want to just go read the Bible, read a book. Um, she is sitting at Jesus' feet in her heart, not just physically. You can be at work or driving a car and be at his feet in your heart. <laughs> this is good. This is good news. Uh, you can read Jesus' autobiography, which is the Bible, or simply learn it by talking to the author. Because his insights are incredible. Okay, Genesis 6.13. And then I'm going to go to chapter 8. <clears throat> okay, this is um, starting at Genesis 6.13. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And make thee an ark of gopher wood. A uh, room shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. Now, and th so this is after they've been in the ark for a while. We're moving to chapter 8, and it's getting close to the flood being over and everything. 8, uh, 7 through 12. Speaking of Noah, and he sent forth a raven which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. Also he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. And the dove found no rest. The dove found no rest for the soles of her foot. And she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him. 
in the ark. And he stayed yet other seven days. And again, he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came into him in the evening. And lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew. So Noah knew. So Noah knew that there's a new creation out there. The dove brought back proof that there's a new creation out there. Knew that the waters were abated from the earth, and he stayed yet other seven days and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him any more, because they were arriving at the new creation and going to live there. Okay, so uh, just I'm going to have to read this. Oh my goodness, I have so much. <laughs> um, the dove brought back to those in the ark proof of life and the proof of a new creation. Sadly, there are many who would have, have suffered, who would have studied the branch. Sadly, there are many who would have studied the branch, examined its properties, or made sermons that speculated what the greater reality represented. Then some would have made a special place of worship in the ark, for the only object that had new life in it. They'd set up this little branch, this little, and they'd worship it and say, oh, this is where we found new life. Uh, that's just a evidence. Anyway, um, <clears throat> um, they would recall the stories of what it was like when the dove first brought it and of how everyone was affected um, while they're still living in the ark, by the way. <clears throat> but all along, it was only meant to signal a greater reality for which they must pursue. There are those who would only ask of the dove to bring them twigs from time to time that they might impress others with their life-giving revelations of another world while they all continue to in exist in a stinking ark with all the various beasts. Wow. <laughs> so Genesis uh, 8 19 through 20. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds went forth out of the ark. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Whoa! He let everything go, every creeping thing <laughs> go. But the clean things, here's your place. You're like the firstborn. Here's your altar. All right. <clears throat> Numbers 13, <laughs> 20 through 24. <laughs> Praise God. This is confirmation coming from the heart of God to you from so many different scriptures. This is Numbers 13. And go spy out and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not. And be ye of good courage and bring of the fruit of the lamb. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob as men come to Hamath. And they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron. And I'm going to skip just a section here. And then, and they came unto the brook of Eshkol and cut down, cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bear it between two upon a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. The place was called Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes with the children cut down from thence. So, by reason of the grapes, you know of a greater reality. He brings it back out of the promised land to them who are at the border. But they're not in the land. They're just getting the fruit of the, of the land. So, just like the dove, this is proof of a greater reality. Um, but they never go in and they never make it their source. Remember, they, a whole rebellion took place and they never entered in at that time. Um, <clears throat> the place is more important than the fruit and is the thing God wanted you to possess. Many can enjoy the grapes of Eshkol, though they never enter in themselves. So get up and enter in. Yay. All right. Second Kings 7, can you believe we got all these scriptures? This is the last group. Uh, but what, if I've gone over, I'm going over. This is the first time I'm really going over bad. So y'all forgive me. Um, 2 Kings 7, 1 through 9, and then 16 through 17. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall be a measure. So, so Elisha is prophesying that there's going to be 
fruit and food. They've been locked up in the castle, in the city, all this time starving. And he says, tomorrow, today, it's been horrible. And the past week and the past month and the past year and the past several years, it's been horrible. But tomorrow, mwah, it's going to be wonderful. Okay. So, um, uh, then a Lord whose hand the king leaned, uh, leaned upon answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And, he's, and Elisha said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not eat of it. Okay. Well, we know the story, don't we, about the three lepers? <laughs> so I'll read them. And there were, oh, sorry, there were four lepers. Four lepers, a lepers men at the entering in of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? Let's get up and enter in. Why? Why are we doing this? Uh, if we say we will enter into the city, then the famine in the city uh, is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we also die. Now, therefore, come, let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. We're going to die anyway. Might as well get up. We're going to die anyway. So let's get up and go, go, go after this thing. Um, and they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots, the noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. God can turn things immediately, but we have to get up and go in or in. Because <clears throat> if all that is sitting outside of the city and we're just sitting there waiting to die, then we never get it. The lepers got up and entered in. Um, and when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent, carried thence the same, and went and hid it. Okay, so they're getting all the good stuff and hiding it and eating while they're doing it. Then they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings. This is a day of good tidings. This is a day of good tidings. And we hold our peace? Somebody says, why is Randy so excited? Why is he so... It's a day of good tidings. You think I'm going to hold my peace when the Lord has given you, telling you, enter in, He's ready, He loves you, He's changed it, you know, don't put on the same old garment, rip that thing and put on His garment, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians, so a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. And the king appointed the Lord on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate. And the people trod upon him in the gate and he died as the man of God had said who spoke when the king came down to him. So Elisha said to that guy, you don't believe you're not going to. Of course, you're not only not going to enter in, you're going to die in your own stuff. I, the Lord has made a way and you're not just saying, yes, Lord. Amen. Yes. Um, so you shall see it, but you will never eat of it. <clears throat> so why sit we here? You know, why sit we here until we die? <laughs> Let's do it. I, you know, if I, could, if I could unmute all of your your mics right now just don't do it but i would have you all just yelling with me jesus yes yes he's our life we're in him we enter into that by faith we don't we're not trying to get in him we're in him but we come to that reality that reality fills us by faith so we we hear the word of faith the word is nigh you it's in your mouth and in your heart this is the word of faith that we preach that Christ is in you now and is your life. And we enter into that by faith. And we say, I'm going to get up and I'm going to enter in because I want the Lord. And at the sound of, of water, uh, my cut off tree trunk begins to grow and to sprout. 
but the sound of the Word of God, it begins to fill my heart to want to go after Jesus. So let's pray. Father, we just come in Jesus' name and we thank you that I see again, again and again and again. I'm amazed constantly that you are constantly never giving up on us, constantly breaking through and, and showing your true heart, constantly saying, come on, I'm ready and, and you should be ready for me. You're the bride, bride, and I'm the bridegroom. Are you ready? And so when I come back, you know, have your heart lit. Have the fire burning in there. Have the altar fire burning in your heart. And let's meet up and let oneness fill our destinies together in you. So, Father, we thank you. We love you. We thank you for that, Jesus, that nail-scarred hand that has reached out to us today and touched us with the reality of what, you're, what is in your heart that calls heart unto heart as we move toward you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.